Alrighty. I'll do the intro to the show and then we'll start talking. Cool. It's nothing you don't already know. I might <laughs> ask you some philosophical things and I, I know you're deep into that. <laughs> well, I'll try and look. So I, I have some books here. I can look something up if I have to. So <laughs> there you go. So we are live. I'm going to record on my computer because I've been Zuckerberg. <laughs> Facebook, wake up. Hi. Nobody ever watches while well, these are going on. I get it. I'm not Debbie Baza. <laughs> Never be Debbie. But I'm telling you guys, oh my gosh, thank you for all your support on these shows. And I send them to military places. And well, today we have somebody here that who's also a veteran like I am, except he really served. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Navy in the house. We got Jim Maywalt out what? of the East Coast. Hi, Jim. What's happening, Linda? We like to say New Jersey. We don't want to be mixed up with anybody from Philly or anything like that. So, <laughs> New Jersey. <laughs> what city in, do you call home? Uh, straight out of North Wall, actually, which is uh, between the metropolises of Glendola and West Belmar. So, uh, very big, thriving cities. Um, right near, uh, just south of Asbury Park, really. Ooh, Asbury Park has some history. Yeah, yeah, lots. The, the boss and the great spot. Yeah, I'm going to do your intro right now. Let All me right. try to do this without real, these are fake glasses. <laughs> really? Yeah, Gladys <laughs> told me to look like Dolly. Uh, hello, Dolly, Carol Channing, so oh, I'm okay. trying out glasses. <laughs> Gladys usually just tells me to lose weight, you know, <laughs> lose 20 pounds or gain 20 pounds. <laughs> oh, yeah. I found it. Okay. Jim, Jimmy Maywalt is a writer, actor, and producer on the No Filter Comedy Show. Hi. He's a comedian, a husband, a father, a brother, and a friend to all. And I know that is true. A man of the people, and like me, a veteran. Straight out of the basement in New Jersey. Welcome, my guest, the <laughs> one and only Jimmy Maywall. Who wrote that, man? Who wrote that? Thanks. <laughs> it's great to be here with you. Thank you so much for taking time. Yeah, absolutely. So, talk to me about your entire life. My voice is coming in and going out more than I don't know. There's a punchline there somewhere. All right. <laughs> Just well, start start when you were six years old, how your parents loved you, and that's why you're doing comedy today and put something in the middle. <laughs> well, talk about six years old. It's it's funny because my it's not funny, but my father died a year and a half ago. So we had to clear the house out, right? Of all the Maywalt family valuables, which totaled about uh negative six or seven hundred dollars when I finally paid the people to take the stuff out but uh you know the stuff that, that means meant something to your mom or your dad my i came across this envelope of all of our, our report cards and uh so if you want to go back to six that's when i got a a note uh sent home from the teacher that says um jimmy has a habit of hitting the other children when they won't share with him so there were some problems you know right out of the right out of the gate and uh Every report card said daydreamer, you know, um, but we lived up in upstate New York till 77 when I was just over 10 and we moved to Jersey. And so we lost everything up there, moved down to Jersey. My dad went to work in the city. Doing moved, what? Doing what? He, he was a uh, advertising sale, right? So he was a, he was a, a great guy, but a maniac. Saw a couple company cars in half, blew one up. Uh, lived like um, something between Elvis Presley and Archie Bunker, but Elvis when he was in the later years. You know what I mean? When the jumpsuit didn't quite fit. So he was a huge character in the house, right? Huge, huge. Uh, when he when he got home, um, <laughs> but um, very funny, funny man. And my mom was. You know, uh, one of eight Irish Catholic 
maniac Irish Catholic family, but great family, um, you know, eight kids, eight, they both sides had the Irish Catholic rhythm method, you know, put some Art Garfunkel on, get hammered and start making babies. There was no rhyme or reason, you know. So anyway, we moved down to Jersey where I had to learn how to defend myself. Luckily, I had seen Rocky and uh, <laughs> Rocky gym set up. I, I couldn't take I talked funny. I was in six years of speech therapy, you know, couldn't say R's. So it was like, say R, Jimmy. And I'd be like, ah, uh, you know. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, you know, it was from 14 to 24, a little bit of a maniac. I played football. I worked, I was ineligible for any sports after football. Go ahead. Tell me about your football. I'm a huge football fanatic. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, um, not that I, anybody watching cares, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> I played for eight or nine years and um, I never touched the ball once. If that tells you anything, I was not a skill position player, Linda. Um, you know, I, I was on a team down here that was kind of legendary. So it was really good players. So I didn't play until my senior year, really, which is when my dad started talking to me again, once I got on the field and actually had some playing time. But um, <laughs> Uh, I loved football. It was legalized violence in my mind. And I had a lot of, um, Still is. I had a lot of energy to get out, you know? So I was like, screw the game. Let's just keep practicing because the games were boring. If you don't play, the games are like, you're just standing out in the cold for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? If you're, if you're just a tackling dummy and running around, bumping into things, that's a lot more fun if you're not getting any playing time, but, yeah. uh, you know, we so had a guy, we had a guy in my high school, yeah. Jimmy, and he used to complain. Oh, they had me sitting on the bench, sitting on the bench, sitting on the bench. I said, well, stand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, my sophomore junior, I was more than happy to not go on the field because I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know, even know what we were trying to achieve unless in practice. I know it was like just running into things, but I didn't know any of the plays or or anything. So um, my senior year, though, I, I actually <laughs> looked at the playbook and memorized a couple things and, and had a pretty good, um, you know, a fun. A, it was a fun year, you know. Then I made the mistake of walking on at Wagner College in Staten Island, where I got there. I was 17 years old, and most of the guys there were like 26 that were playing football. You know, like the, the coach at the time would go find like really good high school football players that ended up being pipe fitters, union guys, hell, hell's angels, criminals, any of them above. And he would get them to come back and, you know, play football. And uh, so that was a mistake. And and <laughs> Wagner realized it was a mis there was a huge error in the admissions policy allowing me to come to the campus because they the dean with uh, like two weeks left of the second semester said, uh, Mr. Maywall, you are academically and socially unacceptable here at Wagner College and you should go home and get a manual labor job. And I was like. Finally, somebody's talking some sense around here. I didn't want to be here anyway. I'm daydreamer. I, I hit the other children. Didn't anybody follow up on this stuff? I straight D's in high school, you know. I don't want to be here. So I had a shovel in my hand for four years, which was the greatest job I ever had. You know, I'd still be shoveling that same amount of dirt across the country if there was any money in it, you know. Listening to classic rock, smoking joints, you know, drinking beer, shoveling dirt. It's great. Well, since you're an efficient auto of football, what do you think about women playing with the men? <laughs> oh, I don't. I, hey, listen, <laughs> you know, um, I think there was times the coach would have had to ha would have rather had the girls softball team, you know, instead of me out there, you know, anybody um would have been better i would think but i have no problem man whoever can get the job done um you know i mean there was you know there's there's uh i mean definitely if i'm picking teams if i was the one picking the teams right and i know you know some if there was some women that i don't lined up against me i would pick them over me because they're tougher you know what i mean and they're gonna 
they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna take the time to learn the plays too. That's the other thing. They'll they'll learn what's going on. If you're if you're up against say your um, defensive player and you're pitched up against a woman, do you hit her harder or lighter? Or the oh, same? I I hey, if you're gonna chat, put the chin strap on, everybody's fair game, right? Right, because I know they're not going to give me any breaks. Do you think that that woman that's across from me, I got Dopey Maywalt on the end. Do you think she's going to say, oh, I'll take it easy on Knucklehead here? No, she's going to forearm shiver me and try and embarrass me in front of everyone, you know? So, oh, I'm, I'm going 100%, Linda. If you if you're, if you got the helmet on across from me, it's on like Donkey Kong. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. So after after college, age twenty four, what happened in your life up to today? Well, there was uh, at by the time I was twenty four, um, the only real major thing that I accomplished was I acquired a a major drug and alcohol problem, which was what I was working to achieve since I was fourteen years old, and I really put a lot of time into it, Linda. I mean. You know, if I drank, I was going to get drunk. You know, like if the smart kids, they open a book, they're going to read it. Not me. But if I drank, I'm getting drunk. I'm taking it right through, you know. And uh, and then, you know, there was other substances sprinkled in there that just would, you know, uh, you ever do a good cocaine project, Linda? You know, when you, you get on the back of an end of an eight ball and you just take the engine out of the car. The hell with it, right? It's. No, I, I, I don't well, even get near an eight ball on the pool table. No, you're, well, you're smart. Either either place is no good. But no, I, <laughs> I um. So at 24, I um had this brief moment of clarity, and I stopped drinking and and using drugs. And uh, a year and eight minutes later, I went in the Navy because it was going to pay 75 percent tuition. It was 30 days paid vacation. Get to see the world. Health insurance. And I had to get out of New Jersey. I, I really felt like with my behavior over between um, 1980 and 1990, that people were always trying to put a tent over me and would charge admission at any moment. So it was a huge, uh, fresh start and probably the best thing I ever did in my, in my um, best choice I ever made in my life. It was really good for me. Me too. When I went in the army, best choice ever. Tell us a few little fun stories. It doesn't have to be comedy, but a couple of things that let us get a peek into who you were in the military. Well, I was uh, I was wrapped tight, Linda. This was like my big opportunity. You know what I mean? So I was I was um, and I was not drinking, you know, and I so, you know, I went through. Well, first of all, you know, you take the ASVAB test, right? And they say, you don't have to study for it. Perfect for me. Thank you. I'm not, I wouldn't have studied anyway. I'd have bought the damn book. I wouldn't have looked at it, right? I'd have paid $30 for the classes. I wouldn't have gone. Give me the test. Let's see what happens. You know, so by some miracle, by some miracle, and there was probably an error. I got like, a 94 or whatever on the ASVAB. Now, I don't even know how good or bad that is. But when I went in to talk to the guy, he said, you're going to be an electronics technician. I said, all right, whatever. Because <laughs> I was like, let me in. I didn't even know what that was. And he goes, and you got to sign up for another two years. But I said, why electronics technician? Well, the, your ASVAB says that you can get through that school, which is really the only way, you know. So I get down to that school after boot camp. And I was like, no, 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 you guys got the wrong guy chasing electrons. I've been shocked five times on construction sites for general stupidity. Right. So and you want me to be an electronics tech? Not a good, not a good idea. Literally, this is the, I'm on the construction site. I plug the radio in, plug it in, plug it in, turn the radio on. Radio's blasting music. Hey, boss, is all the power shut off in the house? I'm going to undo the dryer. Right. With some snips. Yeah, don't worry about it. I'm the guy to plug the radio in. The radio is playing and I go to undo a, a electric dryer with unshielded snips and it threw me against the wall. So just, you know, so you get the idea. Wow. Anyway, I was like, why don't you just let me uh, 
go learn how to blow things up and I don't know, kill people. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I'd probably be better than that, than this. And they said, no, we think if you can pass this, then you can go to the fleet and chip paint for four years if you want. But, you know, we think you can pass it. So I got through all of electronics school without knowing anything about electronics. And how I did it was <laughs> got through the little thing in Orlando. Then they sent me up to Great Lakes. <clears throat> And the first week of class, the guy says, may waltz in over his head, the teacher, in over his head, not going to make it, right? He can try study hall, but it's doubtful that he's going to get through this program. So um, I went to the study hall and the retired electronics, I said, you know, they have practice tests over there. I said, really? Where do you go for that? Oh, you know, class, whatever, whatever. So I go over to the practice test every week. I wouldn't pay attention at anything in class because I knew I wasn't going to get it. But I would copy that there was 10 practice tests, which are like 100 questions. I'd copy the question and answer down and I would just memorize them. Right. I would just sit and read and memorize 100 other things. And I figured if I could get enough of them and sometimes they'd switch to question and answer, I'd get uh, I'd get about a 70 and I made it through. And then when I got to the actual ship, the USS Estotian, it um, it kind of all came together. And after those guys, you know um kind of unwrapped that tightness a little bit you know yeah. what i mean okay. yeah the, the uss what Estotian ffg 15 what's that mean uh it's a guided missile frigate and it was number 15 it was from a class of uh really smaller destroyers that i think were were designed and built for the coast guard or designed for the coast guard in uh, jimmy carter's era and uh, they built about 100 of them at first. And the Coast Guard said, we don't want that piece of shit. So they, said, <laughs> so, so they figured, well, they're like an aluminum frame or body or something. They're good on gas. Let's make a couple hundred for the Navy. Because back then, you know, when they were designed, the Russians had 17 <laughs> battleships and 3,000 helicopters. And, and you know, then it's a, and the U.S. has like a tugboat and two Jeeps. Uh, one of them only has three wheels, you know what I mean? So they're trying to like up our numbers of whatever could potentially kill people or destroy a city with ships. Must, you know, let's, let's get our numbers up back with the Russians in this, you know, before Ronnie Reagan comes into office. So yeah, did, the, was, did the troops ever come and do a USO tour near you? Um, no, because <laughs> <you know? laughs> um, we weren't attached to a battle group, Linda. It was, it was actually a ship that was only supposed to go out um, <laughs> one weekend a month and six weeks in the summer, which is why I thought the program I was in was great, because I'm going to go right to college when I get to that ship. And when I got to the ship, they said, OK, uh, jackass, we're getting away underway for 200 days or whatever it was. Um, but we weren't attached to a battle group. You know, the battle groups go six six uh, months out, six months in, and they actually have like, you know, uh, a carrier, some subs underneath the destroyers, supply ships, and all the way on the outside, the first ones to catch the missiles coming in are the guided missile frigates that were, uh, you know, that I was on. So we were we were not attached to that, though. So we would go like... One of our big missions was going to Eastport, Maine, to help them celebrate Fourth of July. That was a that was a a big one. And then uh, we surrounded Cuba when the guy was putting tires around people's necks or something. And they and then that was um, we had I think about 13, 15 warships surrounding uh, not not Cuba, Haiti. Oh, sorry, <laughs> don't want to start an international incident, Haiti. Right. And we were stopping ships from bringing them gasoline and Twinkies and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and then they realized all Haiti has was like a broken down cannon from and some cap guns. And we we all went home. But, um, you know, Great Lakes and went through the Baltic Baltic ops. That was cool. Panama Canal counter drug ops. That was a very serious mission. We basically we hung out in the Caribbean and um, had Mongolian barbecues and and watched the planes go by. You know, <laughs> we're not going to shoot them down, I guess. Right. So, <laughs> but yeah. Well, who was your best friend in the military and what's your most favorite memory in the military? 
Oh, uh, well, the guy, the one guy I still keep in touch with is Bob Mazzani. Um, he's down in Tennessee somewhere building, probably in the midst of building a barn or skinning a deer right now or making venison sausage or something. But he's he's done really well. Good guy. Um, his actual name, um, I'll, I'll leave it at Bob for now. <laughs> Right. But nobody had like in the Navy, my name was Chuck. I don't. And it's just, you know, they, the, the new uh, officers would come on board and, and say, we're looking for Jim May or Jim. You know, where's Jim in the work center? People were like, we don't have anybody here called Jim. Right. And was, the guy, Jim Maywell. Oh, you mean Chuck. So, um, so that was, he's probably the, the close guy. He got good guy. Funny dude. Um, yeah. What was the second part of that? I'm sorry, Linda. I, I forget. I didn't play. For, you know, I didn't. I should have worn the helmet more when I went out there. You know. Uh, <laughs> um, what, was, what was your. So you were a mechanic, did you say? Electronics? Electronics. I was an electronics technician. So. Um, E.T. They, uh, well, E.T. That's right. That's right. And um, so, you know, we maintained. All of the high freak, I maintain the HF two to 30 megahertz, the high frequency transmitters and receivers, um, you know, which was cool because just all of our little, our little cell phone doodads and everything, if the crap ever hits the fan and there's a nuclear war or, or the, you know, the, the uh, volcanoes decide to, nobody's talking to each other because it's all satellite, right? So uh, these transmitters, I'd be in the Baltic and, boom a signal to some huckleberry that lives next to a waffle house or crackle barrel with a with an antenna on the side of his house <laughs> some <laughs> operator which i'm who i am eternally grateful for those guys and i'd be in radio bouncing a signal to them and um you know we'd hook up at christmas and holidays for people to be able to talk to their family so wow. i kid about it but some of these guys were just fantastic we'd be out at sea and and uh they patch in our loved ones, you know, while you're, while you're out at sea and, and, and everybody get to talk to each other. Oh, so cool. Yeah. So very, very cool. So talk to me about what happened first after the military, were you married? When did marrying and getting into performing start? Cover well, those two topics. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Real quick, performing when I was six, I, I I used to stand in front of the family and sing. You picked a fine time to leave me, Lucille. You know, and I always used to say, I always used, to, I always thought they were saying four hundred children, four hundred children, and a crop in the field, not four hungry children. I was like, four hundred children? They got to be Irish Catholic. I mean, it got to be. There's no doubt about it. And um, but I remember that that feeling, and I remember people saying, "He's going to be a star" or whatever. But whatever, you know, you just, it just, we, guys like me don't do that. We don't do that. You know, you got to, you know, be under the radar or whatever, you know. And uh, so um, when I went in the Navy, um, I met my, my wife, Julie, who was really, you know, and at the time I was probably sober a year and a half or so. And, and uh, she was really probably the first woman that I had a decent conversation with, you know, <laughs> most of the, most of the conversation I had with women before sobriety was like, um, why do you always get drunk when you drink? And I was like, magic, I'm invisible now. You'll never find me. Zoop, zoop. Yep. <laughs> I was the original ghoster, but they were grateful for it. So nobody was complaining. I never saw Jim again. Oh, thank God. I never saw that moron again. He pulled our shrubs out of the front lawn after he got hammered, you know? So, um, so uh, <laughs> it was a huge, you know, gift that I, I met Julie was not looking for any, you know, but um, so uh, we got married <laughs> and we, um, so we kind of planned it like our kids, like my, uh, my sisters and I, my sisters are 11, 11 months apart. I'm 12 months behind my middle sister and they had no money, college students and married student housing and couldn't even get, you know. So, again, the Irish Catholic rhythm method. I mean, it, when when I was born, if my mom had a third boob on her back, she could have twirled and cooled the room down because she we'd have one on each boot. You know what I mean? So um, crazy. So 
we kind of planned it where uh, our first daughter, Jesse, would be born when I got out of the Navy, right? So when I got out, we went to live with my parents in the town I live in now for a year and a half. And I commuted, I did construction and commuted up to Rutgers to get a, um, a degree in journalism, right? Um, uh, two, because I like to write, but number one, because it was the quickest degree I could get, you know what I mean? With all of the uh, compiled credits I had from the Navy and various places of education that I might've gone through the class enough to get credit for, you know? So, I did that, and then I, I um, <laughs> while I was there, I actually interned for Imus in the morning, and wow, hooked up with um, you know, we were in Secaucus, he was in Queens, and but the executive producer kind of hooked me up with this guy, so I ran batteries for a guy who was doing shoots on the weekends, and kind of see how that went down a little bit, but again, never did anything with it. Now I'm, you know, I got to get into sales or something. I got to make some money. You know, I got a wife and kid and we got to start living our life. And, and uh, so that's, that's what I did. And then in the mid two thousands, I um, went down to this club, uncle Vinny's in Point Pleasant, probably about 10 or 12 times, went and opened for a very good friend of mine now, Joe Anthony and not open hosted for him. And I probably got up on stage maybe 15 times, but um, I had a construction business. It was 07. One of the wings got shut off my business. It's plummeting to earth. My kids are like two and four and I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? I had to get out and, and, and get some concentrate on work. So I did that, went back to work in New York and um, ultimately four or five years ago, uh, I called Gladys Simon, our friend Gladys, and she got me on stage up in um, in uh, at the comic strip, and that's nice. when I went back. And that was four or five years ago. Well, it was. What happened was, is um, uh, my nephew Tommy um, died of an of an overdose tragically, and um, I was. The, oh, thank Sorry. you, thank you very much. My sister Colleen is a huge is really done a lot of work with Shatterproof and, Shatterproof and some other organizations to bring awareness to the stigma of drug and alcohol addiction, which is um, as much of a killer because it stops people from getting help, you know? But um, so he passed and I, uh, I was down at the funeral and one of her friends, um, you know, was looking at my tattoo and she says, explain that to me. And then she said, let me see your palm. And I showed her my palm and she said, let me talk to you outside. So she went outside and she was talking about the chakras and she felt me right in the middle of the chest. And she said, you're blocked. You're what's going on, man. You're not, you're not supposed, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know? Wow. And um, what do you want to do? And, and I said, well, I want to be a stand up comedian, you know? And, uh, and that's what I've always visualized. Linda, there's a lot of things that I've done, but I, I have this vision of coming out on stage, crazy people, making them laugh. You know, um, and if, there's other points in my life that I would not have said that because, but that's just the truth. You know what I mean? But I don't want to say I don't want to say people think I think I'm so special or something because I'm not. I could go out and there could be five people there in a dream and I could suck at that moment. You know what I mean? But, but <laughs> hopefully ends and I go out and there's a couple thousand and everybody has a good time. But when I got home from there, I called Gladys Simon, started going on her show. I also called a therapist, started to work out why I was blocked here. And I also dug into my my real job because I have a, a real job that I've worked at for 20 years that is great people, great business, and it allows me to be in New York, um, do well at that, but then also go try and, you know, do uh, do comedy. And, and Julie, that lady we were talking about earlier my wife she uh she's totally behind it and so thankfully are my my kids as long as i don't as my daughter said um pick on the underrepresented which i would never do but i don't even know sometimes where what the paths are you know what i mean but i tr i always want to be the butt of the joke you know me so, too i yeah. would I, I i literally i had in i was babysitting in a church nursery and there was a little girl that wouldn't quit crying. And the, so I was going into overdrive to make her laugh. I literally threw my body on the ground to get her to laugh. And it didn't work. And I broke a rib. 
<laughs> little brat. <laughs> but you know what? You put the hell of an effort in, Linda. That's the key. That's what people will remember, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather be the butt of a joke any day. Yeah. I don't like point. No. I, I won't do those roast battles and stuff. Yeah. Not my thing. Well, you know, breaking chops was the primary uh, skill that you learn when you're in the military. You know, like in the Navy, like just being out on that ship, um, it was just continual ball breaking, which is, which, you know, was fun, especially you get to know the guys and, and because when I got to the ship, I had my shoes shined. I was I had military creases sewn into my shirts, which if anybody was in the Navy, you know, that ever listens to this, they'll go, OK, this guy was wrapped really. T-. So it took them a little while. But ultimately, um, you know, I blended into the into the crew. And uh, yeah, I'll tell you the one of the most in- biggest thing I learned, though, going into the Navy, there's this guy, Joe Glavin, really good guy. First day in the work center. I open up the door and he goes, what's your name? I said, Jim. He goes, what's your middle name? I said, Charles. He goes, Chuck. Chuck will be your name from now on. He goes, you want to go get some beers after work? I said, no, uh, I don't drink. He goes, are you religious? I said, no. He goes, why don't you drink? I said, I just don't drink. He goes, okay. So, you know, Nobody trusted me the first couple, three, four months that was, I was on the ship because they, they literally thought that I was from NSA or something. Like I was some guy coming to inspect what's going on on the ship, which nobody really gave a damn what was going on on that ship other than they were a bunch of good guys. And, um, you know, but after four or five, six months a year, when people do ultimately, you know, trust that you have their back, especially in the military and not that we were in any combat or anything, um, you know, you start to gain a trust. But the day if I had said, yeah, let's go out, you know, you have that instant camaraderie of hey, trust because you're drinking, you know what I mean? Which is fun for everybody. The first, you know, three hours that I drank with them. And then when I'm naked in a drainage ditch and the police are there, or, you know, it gets it gets tiresome for others. So <laughs> I served in Germany during Vietnam. Nice. And we we didn't have each other's back. We, we weren't really in the military. We were like in the military, you know. We don't want to. We we would narc on each other daily. <laughs> We'd been shot if we had gone to war <laughs> by each that's other. What, that's what everybody <laughs> talks about when if you're in the military and you go to Germany, the strength of the beer and I think you can drink it if you're able to join the military here at eleven. If you were in Germany, you could drink at 11, I think, which is, you know, basically the time we started. But, yeah, it's, uh, it was all these legendary stories of being stationed in Germany with the alcohol, the beer and the, the, I guess, the strength of it. My mo- Don't use this against me, but my mother drank when I was in her womb. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well. She was German. <laughs> yeah. German and Irish. The Irish, that's a, that's a, um. That's an Irish, really, um, energy drink is vodka while you're pregnant. I think it builds the electrolytes up for the, also it's helpful for the immune system of the child, development of the brain. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I'm not sure, but I, I think somewhere there was a picture of my mom in a, like a sequence gown with a baby bump with a vodka in one hand and a palm all in the other, you know, and and if that wasn't the case, I really would like it to be. You know what I mean? Because I, 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 I look at that as a positive Jackie Onassis kind of pregnant moment that she's having. Screw the world. And don't worry about it. He, dummy's going to be fine that's in my belly. I'm having a good time tonight. It's all going to be, be a- the perfect triplet joke if you said you know, drinking and smoking and licking the lead paint off of a lamppost. <laughs> yeah. Our parents. Yeah. Uh, oh. We couldn't even, I couldn't even, you couldn't find each other in the family room when you were a kid. You had to like the Marlboro smoke. It's like, hello, yo, anybody, can you get, you going downstairs? Give me water. Because you couldn't see anybody. And they only had kids. I, I firmly believe that my father... I don't even know. They they didn't even know what uh, 
what do you call it? <laughs> when you were <laughs> child, like planning, what do you, uh, birth control. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know what that was, which is rubbed off. So um, I think they just had kids to change the channel, you know, and cut the grass, get them beers, go to the store, get them cigarettes. And um, and then hit the side of the television when it was. <laughs> oh my gosh! We only had three channels. We didn't have Hulu and yeah. mm -hmm. two, four, and seven. Right? It was like that was it. Something like that. Two, four, six, eight. Who do yeah. we appreciate? <laughs> yeah. And they didn't even go all night. I think there was maybe one. I don't know station that went on, but they were like, you know, eleven o'clock. We're shutting it down, guys. Read a book. Go to bed. Be a human being. You'd see the bars, the you know the different bars on there. That basically was telling you, if you're still up right now and you're not working nights, you have a problem. There's some issue in your life. If it's twelve thirty and you're looking at these colors, you should get some therapy or stop doing whatever you're doing right now. You know? Remember when Kate Smith would come on and sing the national anthem, and then you'd hear, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah, exactly, nothing." The part of the it towards the end of my drinking, I was I, I would have to drink alone. But there was this great lineup. It was so hard not to drink with, you know, the odd couple and then the honeymooners and then Star Trek and then the Twilight Zone and then Ben Casey. And then when that new zoo review came on, you were screwed. Like if you were still up and there's giant puppets dancing around, you know, you're probably not going to be employed for much longer because you're not, you're not going to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> that must be where the saying, when Kate Smith sang at the end of the night on television, that must be where the saying, it isn't over till the pleasingly plump lady sings. Because you we know can't what? say that. <laughs> wow. I never thought about that. That might be, that might be right. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I think we're all just assuming that she might have been heavy, though. Does anybody has anyone seen this woman? Because doesn't she do the? the she anchor? could have been a fullback. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just saying. <laughs> well, the fullbacks are in pretty good shape now, Linda. I mean, if you're saying a defensive lineman from 1978, that's a whole nother story. Those guys were there wasn't a lot of athleticism, but uh, oh, none of them heard that. Who's your favorite football team? Oh, the Giants, the New York Giants. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, I mean, um, they had a good year. You know, I just like them. I'm about to put on my website, uh, I got to put some pictures to it, but a poem that I wrote about, uh, and I'm, it's kind of the premise of my book, The Lineman. So um, I was an offensive lineman in, in when I played football for the, um, if, so if I was on a football field, including a practice field, right, if there was a thousand hours of time that I was doing that, there was a hundred hours in the span of that, that I was on the field actually competing and, and um, just because of the way things worked out. But I loved being a lineman and I wrote a poem about being a lineman. Do you want to hear it? I do. Okay. Please. It's, um, it's called the lineman, appropriately. <laughs> <laughs> Shocker. All right. Here we go. Aloft on their shoulders, he'll ride away. This the reward for his victorious play. He'll get the game ball and be asked of his story as we walk behind looking on at his glory. The fans didn't know as they cheered for the benches that the battle was being won by the men in the trenches. So for us, no game ball. Just bags of ice for every yard that was gained, we paid the price. But choose we must do when we enter this game. Do we do it for the glory or do we do it for the fight? And that's it. I love it. Thanks. Love it. And you have a book that's already out or coming no, out? No, no, I'm still, still working on it, but um, it's kind of based around that poem. And it's just mostly part of the crazy stories of what I've gone through in my life, you know what I mean? And kind of coming out the other end. But um, that poem I'm going to put on this new website, which I don't know how to do any of these things. And um, my friend is going to help me later with the website, but I'm so paralyzed with 
the techie tech talk and stuff like that, you know? Uh, but I got some people that are going to help me out. So we're going to do something with that poem with some old football pictures, maybe. So. Is your website up and running yet? It is. JimmyMaywalt.com is up. Yeah. And it's just some creative stuff, some scenes from the No Filter comedy show. Which, Tell us uh, about that, because I know Flora and yeah, it's uh, other people. So it's a it's a crazy story. So uh, one of the comics, Jose Diaz, and I think even Flora had told me about it. And they said, here, yeah, the guy's right in your town, Wall Township, right? So they got me the contact information. And um, it's MRD Productions. The guy's name is Michael Doyle. He's a, he's, so I, I email him, Michael, how you doing? I just want you to know I'm from Wall Township as well. I've been doing Gladys. Some of these people know you. Really love the opportunity to be on the show, blah, 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 blah. So he calls me like two hours after I sent the email. He goes, Jimmy. I'm like, yeah. He goes, it's Michael. You gave me my first beer when I was 12, when you built my parents' deck, you know? So it was like this crazy thing. And I had known Michael Doyle, but I didn't know it was like that Michael Doyle, you know? What I mean? <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I was on one of the, they had like four, three or four episodes and then I was on one of them just in kind of a small bit. And then for the episodes that we've done, which was um, the media, uh, voting rights, um, guns, and then we have um, um, defund the police and uh, like civil rights. We have three of them are still due to come out. I've been writing and helping to produce and acting on um acting on these so there's a couple of those shot um videos from that and you can go to the actual show no filter comedy and it's a great group of people it's been a great experience and writing with other people on zoom calls and doing the sketches it's really been a lot of fun great learning experience and it's just great folks so i really hope that you know it um it gets some legs out there and and every you know it's so hard to get people's the zero one on these things. So if you get a chance, uh, no filter comedy, um, it's great shows on there. Yeah. So um, before we get into where to follow you and what shows you have coming up, <laughs> any more of that, I just wanted to focus for a minute more or for a few minutes more. Yeah. Like, so you've done a lot of lattices, mics, and shows and hosting. And tell us about what all you've done up to this point in comedy, acting, writing, producing, and where you want to go with it all, please. Um, I really want to work on the comedy. I think that's the first stepping stone in anything. But, you know, you can swing a dead cat in New York and hit a comic. So it's very... <laughs> It's very difficult. Um, we could talk for hours about the process of getting on stage in New York. Um, I've been lucky when the one Scott, you know, Gladys has 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 put me on her pro shows, and I can go to the Thursday show pretty much whenever I like. And I've made some friends with people that that have put me on shows, and um, you know, this guy, Joe Anthony, that I told you, he's a he's a, a well-known comic in Jersey. So we did a show down at the Strand in Lakewood, which is in Jersey, which was local. And we sold it out. It was like 90 people. Um, but one of the things I ha I'm not I'm not chasing it uh, for, because I just feel like the more you chase things, um, I'm working towards it organically. You know, so I'd love to be I would really love to get the comedy going. But I also really enjoyed acting. Um, my favorite thing is the process of ideas, though, is writing stuff down when I think about it, you know, and then making something happen with it. So um, the funnest thing I think to do would be a stand up comic. And if I could work towards getting better and better in that, making a few dollars at it, that would be great. And then writing and um, and acting, you know. Absolutely. You're, such a, you're such a great storyteller. Oh, hilarious! The way you you. you just have me laughing though, and you do it <laughs> you do it in a in a like you said in an organic way. It just it's yeah. just who you are. You're not putting on airs, right? Well, thank you. Um, 
you know, somebody told me, uh, a friend of mine, um, just a few years ago, he said, you're authentic. And, and, you know, that was probably the biggest compliment anyone's ever given me. You know, you just be yourself. And it's taking, it takes people a long time sometimes to be their self, Linda, yes. you know, yeah, you know, until they're uh, about 73 and I'm exactly. 72. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It takes, you know, I, it's, it's a, uh, it's a whole process. If you can make it long enough to 50, or 55 and you know that all the testosterone is leaked out of your ears and into your pillow at night then you kind of get this other facet of life you know what i mean it's um whole nother uh whole nother world so i'm very i'm very grateful with the best thing a comedian can do and the worst thing they can do and then we'll go into where to follow you best and worst things a comedian can do um the best thing they can do i think is is make the joke about them. You know what I mean? And be, uh, be the focus of a, a crowd's laughter. I think the worst thing that some, that uh, you can do is, is be or sound mean, you know, there's a big difference between like something funny and something that's mean, you know, you could tell a joke in a room full of a entirely mixed audience and be pointing your humor at any one of those uh, ethnicities, sexual orientations, shape, size, you know, if you bring it somehow back to you, it's, it's fun and funny for everybody, you know, but to be mean, which I have, I was some, you know, one joke that my daughter said, you should not say that joke anymore. And I thought it was kind of, ha, ha, and it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know. So. Well, I don't know why you haven't been picked up to open for big comics like Bobby Collins, Joe DeVito up at Governor's. You're such a great, great communicator in the, well, I love the way that you just seamlessly and, you know, just so easily make people laugh. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Linda. I, we'll get at it. You know, things will, I, I am appreciative. I mean, Gladys, you asking me to do this is really, um, I really appreciate this because you're, you're a special person and, and you're also, a vet and nobody can ever take that away from us, you know? And, um, um, but I, uh, things are going to happen when they're going to happen and when I'm going to be ready for them. And, uh, however it shakes out, I'm grateful. I'm just going to keep moving forward. You know what I mean? And I do have a regular job that I love those folks there. They love me and I got to keep paying the bills and the tuitions and the cars and the insurance and the, the cat food. My wife's away now, Linda. So I'm actually, I'm monitoring the litter box. If that that's what my <laughs> come to, I'm monitoring the litter box because <laughs> for the cats. <laughs> You're the CEO of the litter box. Oh yeah, I'm in charge. How yeah. come are you in the basement? Can you get Wi-Fi in a basement? I've got these little things that uh, I don't know, spray the Wi-Fi around. But this is where you know, this is where everything is for me. I've got a, you know, an, an old uh, football signed by Phil Sims and the, the chubby, uh, um, I don't know, there's two brothers. They're not, you know, um, I've got all the flags that I collect from around the world. You know, I just got all this stuff. I've got my mask from <laughs> being a rescue swimmer. You know what I mean? Oh. And got that. And uh, so this is where it all happened. And I thought about that. I was like, let me take the computer upstairs where there's sunlight and it looks like human beings live in the, in there. And I was like, yeah, but this is where I'm always on the Zoom. This is where all my stuff is. This is where all my books are and all the crap that you use to reference things. And, and um, so this is where it happens, this little corner of the basement where – People have accused me of keeping hostages down there. I don't have any now that at least you can't hear them. I don't think. And, uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I always tease you and say that if I close my good eye, I imagine you're in a surveillance van out in front of my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Exactly. Anyway, tell everybody where to follow you and what shows you might have coming up where they can catch you on Zoom and live and down the street well cool i am gonna be um 
I'm going to be at Gladys's next Thursday, her early show, 530. You can come out and see some comics at the comic strip and um, and uh, then go to dinner. So a lot of great restaurants up there. And then I'm also going to be out in Brooklyn. I'm just looking it up right now. Uh, February 11th, I'm going to be at the Release Cafe. Great show with guys like uh, Chris Warren, Josh Hyman, Danny Livingston is going to be there. Danny Livingston is a is awesome. You know, he puts a lot of these shows together. And that's going to be at the Release Cafe. We're going to be out there at, what's the time? Five, I think, five or six. But you can go to jimmymaywalt.com. And uh, we just started the site. I'm on TikTok. No idea how to use that, though. I'm actually going to my friend's house later today. He's going to try and teach me how to put things on TikTok. I don't know. I don't know what it's I'm so supposed easy. to do. It's so easy. It's so easy. Really? Yeah. yeah it's easier okay. than anything. Um, yeah. So so that's pretty much it. I don't know. Uh, what else is there to follow somebody on? YouTube? Instagram. YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. All right. Well, No Filter Comedy is... Um, is really where you want to find me. I'm in a lot of the episodes. I've helped to write them and produce them. It's a great group of people. Uh, Brian Kennedy's the host. Um, so no filter without the E, nofiltercomedy.com. And uh, and that's it. You can, you, can, you can walk around Wall Township and try and follow me if you see me. <laughs> um, I work on 36th Street in New York. Um, but I'll, I have my run for my run for your life shoes on when I go to New York. So you might not <laughs> catch me, you know, um, you've been a delight. You're such you're a great delight. guy. Well, thank you. Always. It's so, so great to hang out with you. So great. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say? Anything I didn't ask anything you want to tell people who've been through a hell of a lot in a couple of years, people who are thinking of doing comedy, people who are fed up with life, any encouragement for anybody? Um, no, I'm good. No, I'm good. <laughs> no. Hilarious. No, no, no. You're on your Thank own. You. Fuck it. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm just struggling myself. God damn it. Okay. I'm just, I'm just barely hanging on by a thread. You want me to tell you somebody else how to make it? I don't know. You know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, the only thing I would say really is that for a long time in my life, right, Linda, I thought they made people that did creative things somewhere else. They come from another planet. They, you know, they're different. They're more special than you or me or whoever. And they're just people that uh, spent some time on their craft and got and got probably um, a little lucky too. You know what I mean? With the right place at the right time. So, you know, I would say that the the comedy and all that and the writing and the producing, you know, it's great if the stuff goes somewhere. That's what that's what everybody wants. But the thing is, you're collecting good people. You know what I mean? So. Um, I'm around a lot of good people. You, you know, all the other people that I've met, um, the guys from uh, No Filter Comedy. And that's what life is really all about. Because if, you know, if any of us go tomorrow, nobody's going to give a damn. Any, you know, we're only here for the blip of a radar. So you got to make sure you, I want to make sure I enjoy it, you know, and I love my family. My wife actually supports this comedy and all that. She's great. She comes and sees me, you know um she'll always say don't don't do your don't do your stage voice just stop the stage don't it's you're not on stage shut up you know uh nobody wants to hear it right now <laughs> <You know? laughs> um but yeah hey and, julie when you see this julie for you i want to say thank you for supporting jimmy <laughs> very important that so many wives girlfriends are not supportive yeah she's i'm the luckiest guy in the world, really. I uh, and I mean that. And she is, um, she's uh, fantastic. She's over in England right now with her family, and um, we're going to go over in March and go to the Blackburn Rovers uh, Burnley game, which is a real local. It's like the Giants play in the Eagles, you know, but in a <laughs> in a high school gym kind of thing. So wow, but, is that yeah. like soccer? Soccer, yeah. Got really into soccer. 
That's Julie actually calling right now. I should have picked up and had to say hello to her, but. I better oh. let you go talk to Julie. Thank right. you so much, Jimmy Maywalt. J-I-M-M-Y-M-A-Y-W-A-L-T. Bye. Love you. Love you. Love you too. Take care. Bye. See you at Gladys's. Bye.